Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we said, yesterday marked the 20th anniversary of a monumental day in U.S. history. And I think we've talked before about this being one of those events that we just all remember where we were when this, when this happened. And I don't know about you, but this past week, I have watched more documentaries about that day than I think I ever would have actually sat through, and they were really fascinating. We're going to talk about one in particular a little bit later, but, but one was about women of 9-11. Uh, a, a guard with the, uh, uh, with the uh, port authority. And then there was a woman who was a front desk clerk at the hotel that was literally between the two towers. And it was a woman who got hit by a piece of the plane that fell from the tower. And there were three or four other women, but it was just really powerful because those stories kind of got lost amid everything that was going on. And it, it was from a unique perspective of these women who had to overcome the same odds that everybody else did. It was just a really amazing thing. But I watched a lot of documentaries the last week. Where were you on September 11th, 2001, at about 7.46 a.m. local time? Now, it was 6.46 a.m. where I was living at the time. I was in St. George, Utah. I was a newspaper editor of the Spectrum and Daily News. It was two newspapers. One was based in St. George, Utah, and one was an hour up the road about 2,500 feet of elevation difference in Cedar City, Utah. But I remember it was a beautiful, beautiful, pristine day, just like it was in Manhattan that day. As a matter of fact, I heard somebody say this week that it was amazing because almost the entire lower 48 was without any clouds that day. It was a beautiful day almost across the entire United States. And I was sitting in my chair watching Bruce Lindsay, who was a a friend of mine, actually, he was a, well, a colleague at least, I don't know if we call him a friend, but a colleague, and he, he was given the, late, the last of the local news for the, Kansas, or for the uh, Salt Lake City NBC affiliate. And he, said, he just matter-of-factly at the end of the broadcast said, a plane has hit one of the towers of the, of the World Trade Center, stay tuned after the commercial, and the Today Show will have coverage after, you know, after this. And so I was like, wow, that's interesting. And so I, turn, I stay there, and the Today Show starts. And, this, and the, the guesswork at that point had been that there had been a small turboprop plane that had hit the World Trade Center, which to me, I thought, okay, that makes a lot of sense, because I just had this vision that if a jet had hit it, it would have knocked it over right away. So I think that was what a lot of people thought. But then the first responders, uh, one of the many documentaries I watched this week had an assistant uh, fire chief that had been on a call with people Test, checking out a, uh, a gas leak. And they're the ones that had the footage because a film crew was following him around for whatever reason that day. They're the ones that you see the firefighter look like this and watch as the plane flies in. That was from that fire truck. They were 15 blocks away. So they were the first ones on the scene. So I'm watching this Today Show and, and I'm seeing the footage and I remember distinctly Matt Lauer, who was the now disgraced, unfortunately, uh, 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 anchor or, or the host for the Today Show, he was interviewing a woman on the telephone. She had been living in an apartment pretty close to where this happened, and so she had seen what the first plane. And as she's on the phone with Matt Lauer, they had, a, they had the, like some file footage type thing going at the time, but I hear her scream. And NBC immediately cuts to the live feed and you see the explosion of the second plane. And I remember the woman crying and saying, there must be something wrong with air traffic control. And I remember when she said that, that's when it registered in my brain, no, there's something else going on here. I didn't know what. I wasn't in the know, I was just like everybody else. But I knew this, I needed to get to my office as soon as possible. So I run upstairs, I wake my wife up and let her know what's going on, and I get in my car and I take the seven minute drive to my office. I had no sooner really gotten into the, into the office after getting ready, and then the news comes on that a plane had hit the Pentagon. It's one of those things that just, it just didn't register at the time of what was happening. You just knew that something bad was going on, but you didn't know what on earth 
was really transpiring in our country because I'd never lived through anything like that before. It was amazing. We spent that first hour in the newsroom, myself and my senior writer who was up in uh, Cedar City, Utah, and, and the two of us were calling all of our staff members to get them in early because remember, this is, this is, we're a mountain time, so it's a lot earlier. This is way earlier than what it normal, normally would have happened. And even more so that day because when we were looking at our chart, I had this really immaculate whiteboard with everybody, everybody had a different color of marker, so I knew what every reporter was working on by what day, and it was four weeks out, that kind of thing. And we were, we were talking the day before, oh, tomorrow should be an easy day, look at that. We've already got the centerpiece ready. We've got this one feature story about, oddly enough, 911 operators. We were doing a story about them for 9-11. And so we had, uh, we had this whole thing planned out, and of course that plan went out the window. And it was just a few moments later, after, after all this, we kind of get things organized, and a friend of mine who happened to be the uh, county emergency services coordinator, I hear him knocking on our front door. And I let him in, and, and he says, here's the deal, we can't broadcast this to anybody, but if, if I need you today because we have issues in certain parts of the county, I need to make sure I have your cell number. I need to make sure I can get a hold of you. Now remember, this is 2001. So cell phones were not as widely used quite in those days, but I did have one. So we traded numbers in case we needed to get a hold of it. And the reason was we lived in an area where there were three pieces of infrastructure that, remember the idea was maybe the whole nation's under attack. There were three pieces of infrastructure of importance. One was the Hoover Dam, about an hour south of us. Uh, and if that had gone, it had been bombed or something, then that's the water supply for Las Vegas and a good part of Southern California. Another was the Virgin River Gorge, immediately south of our town. It's what connected St. George, Utah. It goes through just a little bit of Arizona and comes out in Mesquite, Nevada. There's about a dozen bridges that get you through that. At the time it was built in the 60s and 70s, it was the most expensive road project in U.S. history. All it took was one bridge to be gone and truck traffic to all of Southern California would have been cut off. It was the primary way of getting goods and services from Kansas City to Denver to Las Vegas and on to Southern California. And then the last one was Lake Powell. Lake Powell was by far the lowest of, of, of the risks, but there was concern because this was a, a haven for uh, people to vacation, and it also was a water supply issue to a, a different part of Arizona. So those were the things that they were most concerned about. And so we were, we were like, okay, well, we'll pay very close attention to this. Thanks for letting us know. Of course, nothing happened with any of those, thank goodness. But we learned over the course of days that 2,977 people died that day, or in the days immediately to follow from injuries. Um, 412 of those were emergency workers, a little more than 300 of the firefighters who had gone up to rescue people. 125 people died at the Pentagon, and more than 6,000 people were injured. Now here's a number from all those documentaries I watched this week that I had not heard until this week. But they estimate that about 22,000 people were saved because of the actions of people that day the speed at which they evacuated people in the second tower once the first tower was hit. Um, a number of different factors that went into that, but I thought that's an impressive number, 22,000 people. For weeks, of course, we saw footage uh, of people who were at what became known as Ground Zero. Do you remember that? There was all kinds of chain link fence. I can't remember how much, but hundreds of yards of chain link fence, and people had come and they had put a photo of their loved one on the chain link fence. So if anybody saw them, they could make contact. People were just desperate for news for people that, of course, we now know were never going to be found. As a matter of fact, um, it would take years before the last human remains were gathered. And one of those documentaries that I watched this week let it be known that actually there are still people being identified. There was the last one that on record I, that was being identified was, I believe was a woman, and it was only about three weeks ago. Think about that for just a moment. So we started off as a very sad nation. 
we were sad because we had these thoughts of people who were in those planes and how they just, at least for three of those planes, they didn't have any means of, of uh, action. We had empathy for the people, especially, at least I know I did, the people who were in those top floors, that as soon as the planes made contact, they were, there were no way for them to get out because the elevators were destroyed, all of the uh, stairwells had been knocked out. And then, of course, we had those terrible visions of people who decided that they weren't going to burn to death, they, were, they decided to jump. Those were the most striking images. And I can tell you, as a newspaper editor, that was the one image we decided we weren't going to show. Uh, and, and there were plenty of photos for us to use, but we chose not to do that. So we started off sad, but then we got angry, didn't we? We were an angry nation. We got mad because we were attacked, number one. Then we were mad because our government couldn't stop it from happening, despite certainly they were trying to. And then we were upset that the symbols of our democracy and of our economy had been hit. The devastation in, in New York and then the Pentagon, um, those, are, those were symbols of our livelihoods. But then we became a proud nation over time. We donated blood. We gave money. We grieved with people that we didn't even know. Remember the really cool photo of the firefighters raising the flag, almost like the Marines on, I on Iwo Jima during World War II? That was, that, was a, that was one of those iconic images. And then we remembered the people on Flight 93 who took it upon themselves, not just to take over the hijackers so that they couldn't hurt anybody else, but we now know because of phone calls that they made to loved ones before they did it, that they purposely waited to do it when they did so that it, they were sure they would be over rural areas. They wouldn't hit anybody on the ground. Think about how much just calm and savvy that takes to make that decision. It's amazing what they did. So even 20 years later, this is a tragic day and it sticks with me and I bet it sticks with you too. And it sticks with us because it's a shared story. It's a sad story, at least it starts that way. But it's a story that we all lived and we all experienced one way or another. I experienced from the desert southwest. Many of you probably experienced it from the Midwest. There are friends of mine that actually were in New York on the day that that happened. Their experience is very different than mine. But we still can have that discussion because we have that shared experience. The good news is the shared experience didn't end on September 11th. Remember what life was like on September 12th and going on for a little while. What did it look like for you? My guess is you did one or more of these things. You helped a neighbor. You consoled a child. I bet you prayed. Maybe you dusted off a Bible that had gathered a little bit of dust because you hadn't read it in quite a while. You may have cried for and with people. And maybe you hung an American flag out on your porch for the first time. It was interesting, and in a lot of ways, it was actually kind of uplifting. You gotta go back to remember what it was like on September 10th, 2001. We were a divided nation. We'd gone through an impeachment of a former president, and the current president at the time, remember, had, only, had been put in office based on the Supreme Court decision. There was a lot of angst about all that. But all of a sudden, by the afternoon of September 11th, none of that mattered. There was no Republican, there was no Democrat. There was no liberal, there was no conservative. We were all one people, sharing in a story, writing our story going forward. Of course, it didn't last, but it gave us a starting point. One of the, the, uh, the stories that I, that I really enjoyed the most this last week was, actually it was, la it was the week before last, uh, National Geographic Channel had this amazing six-part, uh, ep six-episode series on 9-11. And what they did was they took it minute by minute. They started with the morning of President Bush getting on to the uh, Air Force One to fly to Florida to read to school children to promote his No Child, no Child Left Behind program. And it didn't end until that night when his plane landed back at Andrews Air Force Base. And it wasn't until fairly late in the evening. And then he addressed the nation. 
So it walked through and it kept bouncing us back and forth between here's what was going on at Ground Zero, here's what was going on at the Pentagon, here's what was going on in, in uh, flight traffic control. And it was really amazing the stories that you heard. Um, I heard stories about people who followed someone else's advice to leave the second tower as soon as the first tower hit and then the plane literally went through where they would have been. They survived because they did that. Uh, there were two men who didn't know each other, who made fateful decisions that day, that each of them ended up saving the other one's life at different times as they were trying to get out from the building. Of course, there was the bravery of the firefighters. I told you about the, the uh, assistant fire chief that was at a, uh, at a, uh, uh, a gas leak call. He tells the story of he was the first one there before the fire chief got there. He had to give the first orders. He had to order his own brother to go up the tower and he never saw his brother again. There were the paramedics who were trying to figure out how they were going to triage people. Of course, there were far too few people who were, 6,000 people were hurt, but there were many more paramedics there on site ready to help folks that just unfortunately didn't get that far. And then there was the man who stopped to help a woman that he didn't even know. She couldn't walk any further. She was an older lady and he helped and stayed with her through this whole thing and eventually he gets her out of the building and after he gets free and he's clear, he fi fi figures out that his sister was on the plane that hit the building that he was trying to get out of. Amazing, amazing stories of heartbreak. But I think I needed to hear those accounts. Even though they were sad, I was drawn to them. And the reason was because they started as stories of sadness and they became stories of triumph. And these people exhibited more hope than any human being, I thought, could ever possibly provide. Because of the outlook that they had after living through all this. It provided a glimpse into their lives. It provided them, provided me rather, with a snapshot in time from a perspective that I have no clue how that would have felt. Because we, I don't think anything on that level, we can truly get to where we understand what those people went through but we can learn from them. But I think it's important for us to understand that as Christians, their story parallels our story. You see, our story is one that starts with tragedy. The killing of Christ on the cross. Supposedly the end of the movement, right? This is the guy that was leading it all and he's dead. And then there's triumph because Jesus raised us from the dead. And then there's hope because all of us now have the opportunity for eternal life because of the actions of Jesus. And there's power in that shared story that we all have. And I don't know why it doesn't affect us as much as it does when we talk about 9-11. I guess it's because we can see the video images of the planes hitting those buildings. But at least at Easter time, we tend to focus on that a lot. And I think it helps us understand that we have a shared story as Christians. I think there's a power of a shared story from Acts chapter 4. We're going to go through that today. And it picks up right where Nate left off with reading from Acts chapter 3. Uh, Peter and John are walking along. They're going toward the temple. And they see a beggar. The beggar calls out to them because that's all this person can do. You see, in today's world, uh, we have a lot of folks in here who have canes and rollators and and uh, my wife just had a surgery. She's normally able-bodied, able but she had one of those little scooters, you know, where you've got your leg up on it, you're pushing it along, and the wheels take you where you need to go. Uh, we have mechanisms now to help with such things. We have wheelchairs and motorized chairs and scooters that have battery packs in them. In that era, if you were lame, you fully had to rely on the people around you to provide for your daily needs. You couldn't work. You couldn't buy food, so you had to beg. And so this guy sees these two people walking up, and I think he said, I think he's probably thinking to himself, hey, these guys might be able to help me today. So he calls out to them, and Peter walks over to him. And Peter says, you know what, I'm sorry, I don't have any money, but I can do you one better. In the name of Jesus the Nazarene, get up and walk. Two things had to happen here. Number one, God had to intervene. 
Number two, this guy had to believe that it would happen. I can't imagine what it must have been like for him to all of a sudden feel his ankles get strong and his legs get strong. Anybody who's ever had an injury remembers pretty well the first day that you feel back to normal. I've had, I was a, I was a, a so-called athlete. I was a baseball player. I wasn't very good. Uh, but I was a decent pitcher. And I remember I pulled my hamstring. I actually had a partial tear in my hamstring my sophomore year in high school. And it took me weeks before I felt like I was back to normal. But I can remember when I first went back to practice the first day that I actually felt like my old self. It was exciting. This guy didn't have that experience. He didn't know what it was like to be able to walk. Well, not only did he walk, he gets up, he dances around, he's praising God, he's celebrating because that's what we should do, all should do, and he definitely should do it because of what just happened to him. So Peter and John, I can't imagine what their reaction was to this guy, but they go out to what's known as Solomon's Porch, and they start teaching. Now, this is a scale model at the University of Jerusalem that uh, it is actually the entire city of, old city of Jerusalem, and it, it's a model that shows you what it was like in David's time, what it was like in, uh, after Solomon got done with things, and then what it was like when King Herod finished uh, the city. And so Solomon's porch has two possible places. This is the temple that you see on your screen. Uh, and Solomon's porch possibly could have been the one that's to your right, which is just outside of the, what's known as the Holy of Holies, but it most likely was the spot on your left, which is just outside the temple grounds, but still within the old city. And this part still exists. I had the chance to walk and sit on what we think used to be Solomon's porch in January 2019. And it's kind of one of those like stair step type things. So it's almost like a little theater. And I've got to think that Paul, or not Paul, Peter and John were at the top and were talking to people about what, they, what had happened. You see, they recognized these two guys as being with Jesus, and they took the opportunity, kind of like we talked about last week that Paul did, they took the opportunity and they did it this way. They said, hey, you all, remember this Jesus person. He died for your sins. You might remember him. You crucified him. But he isn't, he isn't done with you. He's not done yet. So they basically teach these folks to repent. Well, the priests, the Sadducees, and the, uh, the, the captain of the temple are extremely annoyed. And I think their discussions went something like this. Oh my gosh, we just got done with this Jesus guy, and now these two yahoos are getting everybody all riled up again, and we got to get rid of them. we got to get these people out of here. What are we going to do about these two? Remember how long it took us to get rid of Jesus? We've got to get rid of these two now because they're going to cause problems. Well, let's pick it up from there because I think the reaction, the reaction to their reaction is important for us to understand. We're going to look at Acts chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. The council was caught by surprise by the confidence with which Peter and John spoke. After they get done with the... After they get done with the uh, uh, at Solomon's porch, they get arrested. And they get brought in, and the, and the council, which is basically the Jewish leadership, the religious leadership in, in, in Jerusalem, they decide they're going to try to do something with them. But they get caught off guard right away, because these guys are not bowing to them. They're not scared at all. As a matter of fact, they're continuing to proclaim who Jesus is in front of them. After all, they understood that these apostles were uneducated and inexperienced. They also recognized that they had been followers of Jesus. However, since the healed man was standing with Peter and John before their own eyes, they had no rebuttal. After ordering them to wait outside, the council members began to confer with each other. What should we do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem is aware of the sign performed through them. It's obvious to everyone, and we can't deny it. To keep it from spreading further among the people, we need to warn them not to speak to anyone in this name, in his name. When, this, when they called Peter and John back, they demanded that they uh, stop all speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus. Peter and John responded, It's up to you to determine whether it's right before God to obey you rather than God. As for us, we can't stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. They threatened them further, and then they released them. Because of public support for Peter and John, they couldn't find a way to punish them. 
everyone was praising God for what had happened because the man who had ex experienced this sign of healing was over 40 years old. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. Peter and John are not expert orators. They're two guys. Two guys who have been on a trek with, with a guy named Jesus for anywhere from 18 months to three years. And remember, they're fishermen. But they're fishermen who just healed a guy who had never walked before in his life. And that got everybody's attention. How's that for a story? A true story. They were fishermen who followed Jesus, and they knew the story because they had been part of the story. They had been with Jesus on, on his walks. They had been with him in Samaria when he talked to the Samaritan woman at the well. They had been with Jesus when he was back in Jerusalem. They broke bread with him. They know that he was crucified, and they know that he lives now because they were in a room together when Jesus appeared to them days after his resurrection. They knew that story because they were part of it. Now, we were not physically there, but we are part of that story too. And the good news is we don't have to be great orators because these two guys were not. We just have to know our story. We may not have our A game every day. We may get tongue-tied if somebody wants to start having a religious or a faith discussion with us. That could happen. We could get super busy and forget about things when we want to meet, when we're talking with someone and we find that they need a little gospel or a little good news. But as I tell people all the time, don't get caught up in the details. A person who's trying to find out about Jesus is not expecting to know book, chapter, and verse. Those mean nothing to them anyway. What means something to them is you. You. The person they're talking with. What does your life look like? What does Jesus mean to you? How has Jesus changed things in your life because of the way your relationship has grown over the years with Jesus? And we all have that story. Because, friends, we are all lost sinners. We share in that story. We're all redeemed by the living Christ. We share in that story. And all who believe share in the gift of eternal life because of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. So we share in a story that's infinitely more powerful than what happened on September 11th, 2001. We can lament and we can be sad today because we commemorated something horrific yesterday. But we have reason to celebrate every day because of what Jesus did for us. See, Jesus the Christ, he didn't take down hijackers. Would have been nice if he had, but he didn't. He did something of even greater magnitude. He cleansed the world of sin for all who would accept him. And you may not know it for sure, but I'm here to tell you, you do. You know this story. Just like any other story you would have told your kids when you were young, your grandkids, the story of where you were on 9-11, you know this story too. It's time for us to do what Peter and John did. Tell it with confidence. Amen.